Welcome to the Grow My Salon Business podcast, where we focus on the business side of hairdressing. I'm your host, Anthony Whitaker, and I'll be talking to thought leaders in the hairdressing industry, discussing insightful, provocative, and inspiring ideas that matter. So get ready to learn, get ready to be challenged, get ready to be inspired, and most importantly, get ready to grow your salon business. Hello and welcome to today's episode of the Grow My Salon Business Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Whitaker, and as I always say, it's great to have you here with us today. Thank you for all the reviews for the podcast. I really do appreciate it. And if you haven't already yet left us a review, then I would be very grateful if you did over on the Apple Podcast app. The ratings and reviews are extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. They do matter in the rankings of the show and they help other people to find the podcast. And I also love to hear what's been helpful to you. All you need to do is go to the Apple Podcast app, search Grow My Salon Business, scroll to the bottom of the page and leave a review and we would be very much appreciative. So with that said, on with today's show. Now, I often say that Being a business owner is a great education because it really forces you to learn a range of new skills, whether it's people management or financial management and marketing. And all those things will push you out of your comfort zone, but you will grow as a business person and as a person as a result. But one thing I haven't really talked about before is the simple life skills and those aspects of humanity that being a business owner exposes you to. So my guest on today's episode is a former Londoner, but for the last 30 plus years, he's been a native of Chicago. He's a hairdresser, former salon owner, coach and educator, Alex Yuanu. And in today's podcast, amongst other things, we're going to talk about the journey of Alex's career, but mostly we're going to talk about the life lessons that he's learned in hairdressing. So without further ado, welcome to the show, my old friend, Alex Yuanu. Anthony, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be on with you. Cheers. Uh, It's great to have this opportunity to talk to you. I've wanted to have you on the show for a long time, and uh, you've given me the perfect excuse to. But before we get into that, um, can you just sort of give us an overview of who is Alex Yuanu? Give us your sort of two-minute backstory so that people know a little bit more about you. You got it. We'll squeeze it into two. Uh, So I'm Greek. I was born in Cyprus, a Greek Cypriot, uh, raised in London. And I worked with uh, Vidal Sassoon in London, which is where I met Anthony, and moved to Chicago in 1986, became the artistic director at Sassoon, eventually opened up three salons called Trio. And right before the pandemic, we shut down uh, and uh, we merged with a, a very prominent salon on Chicago's very fashionable Oak Street. And um, now I work behind the chair a couple of days a week doing clients. And um, the other time, doing some training, setting up curriculums, doing a little bit of coaching, doing, you know, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So, and writing. Okay. (laughs) So that was a a good way to condense 40 years. So that's how long we've known each other, which is a bit frightening, isn't it? But there you go. Scary. Yeah. Now, um, in the intro, I mentioned that phrase, life lessons, that being a hairdresser or salon owner uh, teaches you. And you've compiled a number of anecdotes and stories that have happened to you in your career as a salon owner. And you've called it, don't be late, clean your brushes. Can we start off talking about that? What was the impetus behind putting that sort of collection of life lessons together? Sure. Sure. Well, uh, don't be late, clean your brushes was a, a little phrase that I'd uh, always start with our monthly staff meetings. And uh, it became a little bit of a giggle because before I could even get it out after a period of time, the staff would always yell, don't be late, clean your brushes. And, you know, we, we know uh, that these two statements are pillars of success, right, uh, in order to build your clientele. You cannot be late. Right. It's disrespectful if you're late, um, you know, to the other person. And you have to clean your brushes. You can't charge a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars or ten dollars for uh, a service and pull out a dirty brush. So that was the uh, premise behind, behind our staff meetings. Don't be late. Clean your brushes and, you know, do, you know, do good work. Um, the book itself was it's been quoted as a friendly reminder of how to treat each other. Uh, and like Anthony said, uh, you know, it's a, it's a collection of short stories, anecdotes, experiences 
that really talks of, about the humanity of uh, what we do and a, a gentle reminder that it's not always percentages and ratios and, and numbers, you know. It's like it's the human factor, which I think we need in order to be successful. Yeah, definitely. It's, you know, what you just said then is what I was going to go into and say that I often talk about all those, you know, percentages and ratios and what you need to be doing to build a successful business. And for a long part of my career, where I was teaching the sort of the technical and creative side of hairdressing, that was where my obsession lay. Mm. But really, it's sort of about those three things combined, isn't it? It is about the technical and creative. It is about the business skills. But it's so important to not forget that we're in the people business and it's so much about relationships and experiences and all that sort of stuff. And I think that your little collection of short stories there really captures that. And so as soon as I read it, I thought, right, now is definitely the time to to get Alex on the podcast because I wanted you to, you know, come on the podcast for a while. But it it was all about sort of positioning and what am I going to talk to you about? And I just loved some of the messaging that was in that collection of short stories. And so I want to make today's podcast episode very much, you know, focused on those things. So I pulled out, I think I pulled out six that I thought were, um, well, they were my six favorites. I know, I'm Mm -hmm. not sure how many are in there. I think there's 10 or 15 or something. I'm not sure. Around that. um, um, So so let's go through the ones that that were my favorites. The first one, uh, and I think it might even be the first one in the book, is called The Mayor of Wabash. Um, Correct. So, yeah. So, look, I'm going to pass that over to you. What is The Mayor of Wabash? What's that all about? All right. So uh, it's actually pronounced Wabash. And Wabash, Wabash yeah, right is the street that we were on, you know. Um, and, you know, before before I get into the story, I, you know, just want to touch on something on something that you said. It is so important to have all those three elements together, you know, the technical and the business side. And of course, the niceties, because we all know those really talented, technical, brilliant hairdressers that are not busy. Right. Because there's something there's something lacking there. And, um, you know, indeed, I've seen hairdressers that are probably not that good and they're jammed every single day. So, you know, there's got to be a nice balance between, between the three, but I digress. The mayor of Wabash, uh, our salon was on uh, Wabash Avenue for 15 years. And um, the running joke was I would be outside whenever I was qu- uh, quiet and I'd, and I'd be on my phone and I would usually pace up and down outside the windows looking in and, Inevitably, people would walk by and I'd nod and I'd say hi and I'd stop and, you know, pet their dogs or whatever the deal is. And, um, you know, they dubbed me the mayor of Wabash because I would always be outside talking to people and hugging people and, you know, doing that stuff. And, um, you know, just those little friendly gestures would have people coming in and say, oh, I have to get my hair done. You know, let me go in and make an appointment or uh, it just created a closeness, I guess, with the, uh, with the community, you know, people knew that we were there and, you know, I was the nice man walking up and down with, with his phone all the time. So. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. I, I was lucky enough or had been lucky enough to go into your salon on more than one occasion. And for those people who, who don't know Warbash, uh, street it's in it, you're we're talking downtown chicago it's the middle of chicago so to speak uh, so right. it's it's a busy part of the world it's a great location and uh, you know every time i went in there the humanity i can't think of a better word for it than that mm. the sort of the humanity element that really radiates from you because i think you know, a you. business in so many ways is a reflection of its of its leader and that part of your personality is very dominant and it really yeah. impacted on everyone on your team and the environment that was in there. Whereas a lot of salons can sometimes be quite intimidating for people. Yes. So yeah. yeah, the mayor of Warbash. Yeah. Um, we tried very, very specifically because we were downtown and we were very, uh, I guess, you know, visual and very prominent. We had a lot of celebrities coming in and out and all that stuff. And it was important that everyone liked each other and got to know each other. We weren't just workmates, we were mates. And that fostered that environment of, of likability, if you like. Mm. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. What, what, what about an apple a day? What's that all about? 
Oh, Apple a Day is one of my favorites. So an Apple a Day, I was, I was part of a panel at a uh, school and, uh, you know, the new graduates were in the audience and people were asking questions, you know, what do you guys look for and what's important for, you know, to be hired and all that stuff. And, um, you know, the other salon owners were quite serious. And if you can't tell, I'm not so serious all the time. And so uh, when it came, you know, for me to, to say my bit, I said, well, of course, don't be late, uh, clean your brushes. And if you bring me a shiny apple, you have a better chance. And everyone had a giggle and we finished the day. And uh, several months later, a young lady came in for an interview and uh, she was on time and she looked great. And we had a very nice conversation. And uh, I mean, I knew at that point she was definitely on the list to be hired. And as we said our goodbyes, she said, oh, and reached in, into her bag and pulled out a shiny apple. And guess who got hired on the spot? I mean, it was it was great. And I get goosebumps, you know, when I share stories like that all the time because she listened. And it wasn't about the apple, but it was about the attention to detail and that she showed up prepared, ready. We hired her, you know, immediately. And uh, she was great. She stayed with us for a long time. So. It's, yeah, it's funny. A lot of these, you know, they're just little things, but they're not always things that you can teach. Correct. But it's when you hear them being spoken about, you realize how important they are. They're the sort Correct. of undercurrent of what makes a business and individuals yeah. successful. Um, yeah. There's another one in there that I liked called simply called Coffee Talk. And, yeah. uh, and that certainly made me smile. Uh, so, so tell us about Coffee Talk. What's that all about? So Coffee Talk was... Um, you know, was another one of my favorites. Um, Because what I would do is I would go to one of my staff members and I'd say, hey, let's go have a cup of coffee. And uh, the coffee shop was across the street. So that five minutes between leaving the front door to go to the coffee (laughs) shop must have been so scary and frightful for the uh, employee because, you know, they thought, I'm in trouble. I'm going to get fired. Uh, what did I do wrong? Um, you know, am I dressed pro- properly? You know, there was all this stuff going through their heads. And I remember one, one girl in particular where I said, do you want to go for coffee? And she said, yes. And she sat through our meeting and she, you know, she drank her coffee. And she said that was the first cup of coffee that she's ever had because she doesn't drink coffee. <laughs> but um, coffee talk for me was about, getting to know my staff. You know, it wasn't that anyone was in trouble. I wanted to find out about them. What music did they like? What books were they reading? Uh, You know, I learned about pets and marriages and deaths and all of that stuff. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it brought us close, you know, again, we became friends and I knew my staff and, um, every now and then I'd say, Oh, you know, how's little, uh, you know, Bobby or, you know, whatever the case may be. Yeah. And uh, it was a good way to really connect with people in a, in a true and genuine way. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to do that as well when I had my salons. I often tell people to do that, to get them out of the salon, get them out of the yeah. staff room. And, and whether you meet them for breakfast or you take someone out for lunch on their birthday or you just pop next door with them for a coffee, you know, providing yeah. there's a coffee shop next door. It's that getting to know the person on a personal yeah. level you know it's yeah. it's very valuable and sometimes yeah. people when you talk to salon owners about that they go Anthony I haven't got time to do all that and I say uh, to them no you, you you haven't got time not to do it because at 100% you know, it's all it's, about it's building those just relationships, as important isn't it? exactly yeah, just really, as important really yeah. getting people to you know to bond with you and for you to understand what their life's all about because yeah. you know sometimes I know for me in my early days of salon ownership, sometimes someone would do something wrong. Let's just say something simple like they've turned up late for work mm. frequent, frequently um, and, and you've told them about it and they turn up late the next day and you get a bit upset as a, as a owner. <laughs> you know, you're entitled to maybe. But even then, it's important to, I learned this the hard way, to sort of um, not react without thinking first. So, 
you know, I'm, I'm thinking of a particular incident for me where mm. I said to someone, let's go next door and have a coffee. And uh, so I, we went next door and I said, listen, you know, we got a coffee. And I said, uh, um, you know, we spoke about your timekeeping and here you are again. Like, I don't know what, yeah. you, what, what you are expecting me to do, but I said, I, I just can't have you rocking in 10 minutes after start time when your client's already sat there. Yeah. Uh, at, at which point she sort of burst into tears and started telling me about some major, you know, domestic issue that she was having right. at home. Right. That that made my timekeeping issue of you're 10 minutes late to work again just completely insignificant. Yeah. You know what I mean? This yeah. was potential, you know, yeah. life and death sort of stuff. Um, yeah. And it, it's important to be reminded that your team have a life outside of the salon as well. Correct. And, you know, whether it's elderly parents or children that have health issues or, you know, <laughs> financial problems, husband being laid off work or whatever it is. There can be Correct. any one of a number of things. And it's what you've just said that it's not just a cup of coffee. It's, it's bonding. It's building a relationship yeah. and, and opening the door to have all sorts of other conversations. Correct. So, yeah. It was funny because when I first started it, people were hesitant. You know, it was almost like I'd ask a question and they'd kind of give me a little answer and wait for the, for the shoe to drop. And then when the shoe yeah. never dropped, <laughs> yeah. you know, Often I would have people come up to me after and say, are we having coffee? And I'm like, yeah, yeah let's go have coffee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. The one that really made me laugh was tighten the bolt because oh. um, I totally – related to that because yeah and, and again it's not something usually that anyone talks about Correct. but sometimes we have these little things that we do in private that are just our little idiosyncrasy and uh we sort of share an idiosyncrasy on that so yeah. tell us about tighten the bolt well uh, at the beginning of the story i think i think i started off with the old saying integrity is doing the right thing even though no one's watching Right? Yes, yes. And so tighten the bolt um, basically is me. Uh, you might call it OCD. I don't know what it is. But often I'd go into a bathroom and then find that the seat was wiggly, you know. And right underneath the seat, there's usually a couple of screws. And so I would always reach under, tighten the seat so that it wouldn't be, you know, wiggly. So this is, um, in, a, this is in a public bathroom you'll do this? Public yeah. lavatory, right. Yeah, okay. yeah. a restaurant yeah. or, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. okay. or even my own sometimes. You yeah. know, I'd go in and I'd see this wiggly seat, so I'd have to tighten it. Of course, it's pretty gross, you know. So I have to, you know, wash my hands several times after. But I just felt really awkward mm. um, about leaving, you know, the seat wiggly. Uh, or if there was paper on the floor, if someone had used a bar of soap and it was black with bubbles, I'd wash it off, you know. Mm. So... um the story is, if you can find um, or train or coach or, or develop a group of bolt tighteners um, in your salon, you never have to worry, really. Um, so whether it's a dirty vase or whether it's a towel on the floor or whether it's, um, you know, a light bulb that's gone, someone will see it and, and have the wherewithal to fix it yeah. or clean it, um, you know, and it really boils down to true success is your business growing when you're not there. And um, I couldn't always tighten the bolt, you know, but um, eventually my team, you know, would do that. Of course, I always had one jokester who knew I was going to go into the restroom and they really loosen, loosen the toilet seat, <laughs> you, know, so, you know, but yeah. Essentially, that was it. Tighten the bolt, you know, create a group um, where everyone realizes they're responsible, whether, you know, down to the, the nitty gritty of things in the salon. So. Yeah, it's a very good metaphor for there's as you were telling me that uh, story the first time I was thinking about our former employer. Um, in London and the CEO, the general manager, the owner yes, as he was yes. of the company. And um, there was an incident that I had with him where there's something that I hadn't noticed, um, mm -hmm. you know, the equivalent of the bolt, so to speak. And he took great 
umbrage to it. <laughs> he, <laughs> yes. he, he wanted to know why I hadn't seen this problem and fixed it. And I was a 24-year-old smart aleck, I suppose, at the time. And so I said to him, how do you notice these things? And he looked at me and he said, it's because I care more. Mm. And at the time I laughed. And then five years after that, I was a salon owner of my own business. Yeah. Yeah. And all of a sudden his words, and here I am 40 years later, still yeah. repeating them, his words rang true. Yeah. And that's what a lot of it is all about, isn't it? It's like what you said at the beginning, integrity is, is doing something when no one else when no one's is watching. watching. Doing, yeah. Yeah. doing, doing the, the right thing. thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, that's good. And yeah. what, what about the elephant in the room? The elephant in the room, we all know that uh, adage. And, um, you know, inevitably in every salon, there's going to be some type of conflict, um, some type of issue that needs resolution. And I call it the elephant in the room because um, many times I'd walk into the staff room and it would go quiet. <laughs> and I was like, all right. And I would say, should I step out and come back in or what, you know, what's going on? And, you know, many times people don't want to address an issue because they think it's going to lead into confrontation. And no one wants to be confronted and no one, at least I don't, you know, I don't want to have a fight with anyone, you know. So, but there are issues that need to be uh, uh, addressed. And so looking for that elephant in the uh, room and having the right tools, if you like, where you can strike up the conversation where no one has to be blamed and no one has to take um, accountability, responsibility, yes, but perhaps not accountability. And as a group or as a couple, uh, you can address, you know, whatever's happening and recognize that elephant in the room. Because if you don't address it, it could turn into something really huge. I had one uh, client, you know, asked me one time about issues. And I said, oh, it's just so many little things. It's like no big deal. And she said to me, Alex, a raindrop by itself is irrelevant. But if there's a whole bunch of them, it could be a thunderstorm. I was like, oh, I love you. <laughs> so, yeah, address the issues that are appearing before they become really, really huge. And, yeah. uh, um you know, for me, I found as the boss, I had to be the, you know, the person in between Conduit. many times. Yeah. Cause you know, one would have an issue with this one and inevitably it wasn't anything that anyone did. It was usually what someone said or how someone said it. And, you know, whenever I get into anything with anyone, the first thing I say to them, and I love this is I'm sorry you feel that way. Mm. Sorry, yeah. you feel that way. I had, I got nothing to do with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good words of wisdom there. Yeah. Um, probably my favourite out of the six is the story of Concha. Mm. Um, tell yeah. us about Concha. I love that. I love Concha, and uh, um, I gave her the book, and um, you know, there's a photograph of her that I took, and I wrote, and I wrote the story, and I gave it to her. And then I left, I left the room. And then uh, next thing I know, her granddaughter who works at the, the salon that we're currently at came out and she's crying. And I was like, is everything okay? And then Con Concha came out and she's crying. And I go, oh no, it's the book. Did I, did I write something wrong? <laughs> and then she's, no, no, it was so lovely. And she gave me a hug and all of this stuff. And then I go in, into the staff room and there's three other people that are crying. <laughs> so, the basic story of Concha is uh, when, when I had my salon, we needed um, an assistant. And my wife had suggested Concha because she had worked with her uh, at another salon. And she said to me, but she's in her 70s. You know? And uh, I said, oh, you know, Jerry, my wife, I go, you know, we're, we're funky little salon. We're trendy. We're, you know, 70. And she says, well, just talk to her. So I said, okay, fine. So, uh, by the way, the closer I get to 70, the younger it looks, uh, the younger it feels anyway. <laughs> so, so I said, all right, have Concha come in at 9.30. And, um, you know, I showed up at 9 and Concha was there and all the laundry was done. 
of the, the gowns were hanging. Uh, the floors had been swept. The towels were folded. And uh, she had a toothbrush in her hand. I'm not kidding. She had a toothbrush in her hand, and she was going to do the, the, the baseboards. And she says, I concha, I clean for you. And I was like, you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she said, oh, thank you. And, and then I said, you know, it's not. It's an assistant position. It's only X amount of dollars. And she said, okay. And then I looked at her and I said, all right, I'll pay you $5 more. And she <laughs> said, okay. <laughs> and then three weeks down the road, I said to her, I'm going to pay you another $5. She goes, okay, great. <laughs> and she set the tone for the entire salon, entire mm. salon. The youngsters couldn't keep up with her. Mm. And um, she's with us now. So she was part of the crew that came over to the new salon. And, uh, you know, that was, that was five, six years ago. And she shows up in her hairdresser, black makeup on point, hair done. And she is like a tornado in that room, keep it, keeping the place clean and tidy. And she brings food and she, uh, helps out with her church and she does donations. And personally, I don't know how we ever survived without mm. Concha. And, um, my lesson was don't judge that book by its cover. Yeah. You know, um, because you'll be very, very surprised. And she just opened up my eyes to that stuff. And now, you know, at my age, I look at what I know and what I've done. And uh, I think back to my 30 year old self or 40 year old self. And I just want to slap myself you know, behind the head because I didn't know nothing, <laughs> you know. Mm. So the experience and um, the things I've been able to witness and be part of and, and learn from are just tenfold from that from that age, you know, yeah. when I was yeah. a youngster. So Concha, Concha is, still, is still kicking and still shampooing and still knocking things out. And, you know, I walk in and she gives me a hug still and she's the only one that will shampoo my clients and, uh, and that's mm. that. You know? Fabulous, fabulous. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, I often say to people these days that, you know, the hairdressing industry in the time we've been in it, uh, and, you know, we have a lot of experience. We've been in the industry a long time. And you see how it's evolved and changed. And one of the great challenges now is that, you know, there's a shortage in many places of mm. getting uh, young people into the industry uh, and or getting them to stay in the industry once they do start. There's a lot of people Correct. that in the U.S. go to beauty school and then never end up working in a salon. And the, there's a lot of people in the U.K., Australia and every other country that, that uh, you know, don't complete apprenticeships and they're in and out of the industry in a year or two. And oftentimes one of the reasons, and, you know, whether you like it or not, is sort of irrelevant. But one of the reasons is that young people go, I don't want to be sweeping and cleaning and shampooing yeah. and folding towels. I want to be a hairdresser. Yeah. And it's easy for people of our generation to go, well, that's just not how it is. That's, you know, when I was your age, this is what I have to do. But well, the mm -hmm. reality is that no one cares about what you had to do when you were their age. Yeah. It's a different world that we live in now. Yeah. And so I'm often saying to people that you should look at employing other people to specialize in those areas. And so they know that they're not going to be a hairdresser. They know they're going to be a, a housekeeper or, you know, a cleaner or whatever the term is, shampoo assistant, uh, that you want to call them. And um, I've got two stories on the go here now, but I need to throw in that one. I just mentioned housekeeper mm -hmm. because I went into someone's salon once and they were introducing me to their staff. And, and then they introduced me to this older woman a concha, basically, yeah, uh, the equivalent of your concha. And uh, they said, this is this is Mary. And I said, oh, hello, Mary. Nice to meet you. And they said, Mary's a housekeeper. And then we parted company. They went down. Mary went downstairs and I went upstairs with the owner. And I said, so what does a housekeeper do? Because I'd never heard of a housekeeper yes. in a hairdressing salon. And he said to me, well, she's a cleaner. Um, amongst other things. And I was like, oh, great. And it, it, it just occurred to me how much more there's nothing wrong with being a cleaner and there's nothing wrong with being called a cleaner, but it gives people so much more dignity to call them the housekeeper. Yeah. 
and it makes her feel better about her job and the way other people relate to her, whether it was me or the staff or even clients. So titles are really important like that. And, yeah. you know, the other benefit with it is that it changes the dynamic, and you've just alluded to this, about the values that then exist in the staff room. Mm -hmm. Because when you put an older woman into the staff room, it, it sort of becomes a motherly figure, or in some Correct. cases a grandmotherly figure, when right. they're as old as what Contra is. Yeah. And it changes the dynamic and the energy in the break room. Yeah. And I'm going to suggest for the better, more often yes. than not. It sort of yeah. grounds people a little bit and makes yeah. them feel, you know, more, I don't know, family orientated yeah. or it just takes all the the ego. That's what I'm, the yeah. word I'm looking for. It takes all that unnecessary ego out of the room and, and sort of makes it more real. So, yeah, as soon as I read about Concha and I saw the picture of her, I thought, oh, that's that's a brilliant story. Beautiful. Yeah. It it totally becomes a little bit more respectful, if yeah. you like. And, um, you know, people, we're talking to each other better, you know. Yeah, yeah. Less, less F-bombs flying around, yeah, you know, exactly. stuff like exactly. that. Exactly, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and many times it, it's just unnecessary. And I love the relationship that she uh, developed with the clients as well. Something you mentioned about the training, um, you know, you're 100% right. It's like we cannot train people now, today, the way that you and I were trained. It's a completely different expectation mm. uh, and a completely different era. And so um, just like everything else in your company, whether it's insurance or, you know, workman's comp or uh, the type of coffee you buy, you have to evaluate and reevaluate and um, update. So we ended up changing our program. I can't tell you how many times, um, not just out of necessity, but because we wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, and we changed it around to suit the temperament of the time. All right. We did not do things the old way. We did not want to be the dinosaur in the room, you know? Mm -hmm. So we, um, you know, I mentioned earlier training curriculums um, and, I like to do that. I go in and I have a look and see what each salon's need is. And we create a curriculum based on that salon's need. So mm. someone, for example, might, you know, might want someone on the floor in, in six months. It's doable, provided you have the right curriculum, right? Mm. Back in our day, it was one class every week until 10 o'clock at night. And it took mm. you 18 months. Mm. Assistants these days are not going to wait. Hang 18 on. months. Hang on. Did you say one class? You, yeah, well, you, well it, you was two, it? Yeah, <laughs> well, it was two, wasn't yeah. it? It was two. It was two until 10 o'clock at night. Yeah, yeah. until 10 o'clock yeah. at night. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I remember taking the tube home yeah. really late. but And then inevitably I'd go yeah. home and my mum would have three friends waiting for me to cut their hair. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, updating your curriculum is key. Right. Mm. And you have to stay on point. You have to. We talked earlier about the word uh, relevant mm. uh, and being in tune. You have to be in tune to what's going on. You know, many times I think, you know, and I'm sorry, we're, you know, I don't want to go off the subject, but many times, you know, I find that students come out of beauty schools with unrealistic expectations, mm. um, not blaming the beauty schools, but somewhere, some, Somehow along the line, they're told, oh, you're going to come out of school. You'll be earning $100,000 a year in your first year and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's a thing called social media. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Unrealistic. Yeah, exactly. Unrealistic. Which is a shame because we all know there are people who do manage to do that. But it's, it's the one in 100. And, uh, and then we wonder why there's such a great um, dropout rate of apprenticeships. Yeah. Uh, yeah or, you know, people not lasting in the industry when they come out of beauty school, and it's because their expectations aren't being met, and their expectations yeah. aren't being met because they're sold a dream, which um, I'm never going to say it doesn't exist, because it does exist does for exist. some people, 
But social media doesn't often, you know, portray that. It portrays yeah. it as this is what's going to happen to everybody. And yeah. it doesn't happen to everybody. It happens to some people and it happens to more than just some people when they put in the hard yards and the years of work right. in behind it. But it doesn't happen straight off the bat. And right. I, I think that's, you know, one of the downsides of social media that it, it, yeah. it paints unrealistic expectations that then aren't met. 100%. Um, what I like about your podcast, Anthony, and I listen to them all the time, um, you bring some, you bring a realism to the table. And in our pre talks, you kept it really real with, you know, I mean, we've known each other for whatever, but you kept it real. And I think we're all smart enough to know where there's fluff and tiddlywinks and stuff like that, right? Mm. But um, keeping a, a realism with your audience and you know, asking pertinent questions uh, uh, from your interviewees uh, is what it's about, right? And I think it's key. This is how we're going to educate people and people are going to learn, you know, what the true story is about what we do. It's not just rock star stuff and all of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think everybody has something special and valuable. And it's about finding what is the real value that, you know, because we're all hairdressers. We can all talk about yeah. cutting hair and coloring hair and running our business and coming at it from different angles. But it's, I think you should always look for the, the, the sort of unique quality that any individual has, a unique story or whatever that they've got to bring to the table that can inspire others. Um, yeah. Well, one of the things, I know there are other stories in the, the book that I haven't touched on. Is there any mm. of them that you'd want to mention now or can I go on to something else? Um, well, a lot, a lot of the stories are on my website, uh, alexhaircoach.com. Excuse the shameless plug. Um, sure. <laughs> there's a lot more stories on there. Uh, okay. You know, I find myself constantly writing, so there'll probably be another Don't Be Late, Clean Your Brushes part two. Right, you know? okay. There's one story you didn't tell, and because I have known you for a long time, I'm surprised that you didn't mention it because – I can't, well, obviously, it would have had a big impact on you in your life and yeah. professionally and personally. And I think you know where I'm going with this, but yeah. you've done a lot of firsts on the podcast. Uh, but one thing that I've never had before is that I've never featured someone on the podcast who's been shot um, yeah. in real life. And you <laughs> have unfortunately been shot. Yes. And that really must have knocked the, well, I don't know, the, I was going to say knocked the wind out of you. That's going to be putting it mildly. But yeah. uh, t tell us about that and how has that impacted on you as a person, professionally, personally, whatever, um, as much or as little as you'd like to? Sure. Well, that was a crazy story and a crazy, crazy experience. And essentially, I was coming home late, late one night. I'd gone to see a movie um, ironically, Tombstone. So uh, <laughs> I'd gone to see this movie and I just parked my car and I was walking home and it was about midnight. And, uh, you know, back then my hair was really long and it was summer. So I had my little, you know, vest on and my tattoos were showing and stuff like that. So if I was going to mug anyone, it wouldn't be me, right? Not because I'm big and tough, but I'd probably go get a little old lady or something. But anyway, so uh, I'm walking home and a car drives by and it stops, you know, about 100 yards up, up front and two guys jump out and the car drives off and they start walking towards me. And, you know, when you get that feeling and I'm just like, ah, oh, this, this, isn't, this isn't right. You know, one's in the middle of the road, one's on the uh, pavement walking towards me, but I'm very close to my door and uh, I couldn't turn around. So as we walked past each other, the kid says something and I turn around and he pulls out this gun, cocks it, puts it right in my face. And, you know, you don't know how you're going to react. And I would advise everyone, do not do what I did because it was <laughs> stupid. <laughs> uh, but it was my initial reaction. And I was like, get the F out of here, you know, and I turn around and I was right at my door and I had the key, the key in my hand. And uh, somehow this kid was in front of me with his mate, you know, next to me and he's got the gun at my chest. 
And, um, you know, we had some, some words and I told him to get the F out and I turned around. Now I went to put the key in the door and it was as if time stopped and I heard a bang. And as I looked, I could swear I saw this bullet hit the vestibule and bounce on the floor. And as I looked down, I see a little blood coming out of my um, side here, my little love handle. And uh, I thought, oh, shit, I, I really like these pants, you know, <laughs> these trousers. <laughs> so as I turn around, they're running down the street. And I gave them some more choice words. <laughs> and uh, and what was really sad was that they just shot me. They didn't even wait to see if I was dead, if I'd been hit. They didn't even take anything. They just ran off. So it was basically a gang initiation. So I go upstairs and my roommate at the time, Jimmy, was there. And he said, was that you shouting and screaming? And um, I said, yeah, I just got shot. And my girlfriend was there and sh she came out and I looked down. And I said, you know, I took off my shirt and I looked down. And I go, oh, I got a hole in the front. And she's crying. She says, you got a hole in the back too. <laughs> so I have a look. <laughs> So the bullet literally went into my side and came out the front. And I was so lucky, so, so lucky. Mm. And I got through this with a lot of humor. But really, if that, if that gun had been an inch over or an inch higher, um, I mean, I turned my back on him. He could have put the gun to the back of my head and blew, and blew my brains out. Mm. I mean, it was just so ridiculous. And so... We, we uh, go to the emergency room and, uh, you know, the doctor looks at it and says, yeah, so through and through, they call it. I was like, oh, okay. And uh, he puts a Band-Aid on it. And he says, you're done. No stitches. No nothing. I guess it's the most, you know, it's a very sterile thing, a hot bullet burning through your, your skin. He said, you were very lucky. I said, uh, yeah, thank you. And, of course, I had to speak to a policeman. Um, and all of that stuff. And we went back home and I found the bullet and I wish I would have kept it because I would have made a little necklace or something, yeah, yeah. you know, stuck it in my tooth or something <laughs> like that. <Yeah. laughs> um, and, uh, but of course I had to give it to, you know, the police. Mm. But um, like I said, I got, I got through it with uh, humor and uh, I went to work the next day. And of course my roommate had told everyone and everyone's like, Jesus, what do we have to do to take a, to get a day off around here? And I go, I took a bullet for you guys. You know? <laughs> so, um, you know, we went through this thing and, uh, probably a couple of weeks later is when it started really bothering me because, um, actually a few days later, cause I started getting some black and blue swelling and, um, you know, where I got hit was in, was in the, in a love handle. And so the black and blue swelling started, to work its way down. And uh, let's say I was concerned of about the jewels, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So uh, I took, I took a day off and, yeah. uh, um, you know, and that's when I started writing. So I wrote about the experience and it actually got published in a Chicago magazine. And I had one client who wanted to take it to uh, Sundance and make a movie. And I was like, Oh Jesus Christ. No. So, but it was humbling in a way in that your life can change in the blink of an eye, you know? And um, my wife said to me the other day, what do you want your legacy to be in this industry? Blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, it's not really about the industry, is it? It's really about who you want to be remembered as, as a person. Um, and, you know, without getting too zenny here, but, Mm. who you want to be remembered as, as a person and the good that you've been able to impart and leave and uh, the positive influences that you can uh, put, put on others, you know, like you, I'm married. I've got two children, two young girls, and uh, those are my legacy, you know, and I want to make sure that, you know, some of the things that I share with them will stay with them for the rest of their lives and more. So, mm. Yeah, I mean, I suppose if, if, if that's never happened to you, you can't imagine no. what it would feel like, what that would be like. But no. I, I, I just sort of 
imagine that it is something that really at some level makes you think about life and think about your you know your purpose and and what you value um yeah. in a different way you know and yeah. and and ego and all sorts of things must yeah, yeah. must get addressed and reassessed and thought about when yeah. something like that happens especially when you're young because you were only what how old were you then 30 yeah around yeah. that around, around that age 30? yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and it and it was good because you know it no longer became about the salon mm. it became about the people in the salon it became mm. about the people that I worked with you know and uh, I'm so proud of my you know of, of I still call them my team I mean we we ended up having Naha nominees Naha winners uh, Goldwell Global winners um, you know, like I said earlier, we had celebrities come in and all, and all of that was great. And it was wonderful opportunities for, you know, the staff that worked there. But the most important thing was uh, after I merged with George on Oak Street, I went to Florida for two years and I was managing a, uh, a pretty large salon, spa, wellness center um, uh, in Key Largo, Florida. Uh, very exclusive, you know. Very, very affluent place. Um, and, uh, you know, it was great. And I was there for two years, traveling back and forth, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I learned a lot and uh, I was able to write, to write a lot. But, um, you know, when I came back, um, my team, if you like, the, the people from Trio, were still together. Mm. No one left. Wow. So, yeah. you know... To me, that's legacy where you can build a culture and build a group and build a team where they like, they like each other enough to continue with each other, even though I wasn't there. Mm. And, uh, and they're still always very respectful. Oh, you're my best boss. Oh, you're this, you're that, you know, which is, which is, you know, great. But, you know, the most important part is, is that, is that, you know, we, we paved th this path and, um, you know, I see my staff, some, that started as assistants are now charging more than I am for a haircut. Wow. <laughs> more. Fabulous. Great. And I yeah. love that. Yeah. I love that. You Brilliant. Know. That's great. So be around people that are better than you, that are mm. smarter than you, because that's how you're going to learn and that's how you're going to grow. You know, yeah. if you're the smartest person in the room, think twice. Yeah. So. You've sort of answered this question I want to ask you now from <clears throat> different angles already, but I just want to really focus it on this. Uh, and that is about e your own journey and staying mm. relevant because, mm. you know, through the course of ownership and then selling your business and, and uh, you know, managing another establishment and now coming back to doing what you're doing now and doing a mixture of coaching, et cetera, et cetera. What, what's the key to reinventing yourself what's the key mm. to staying relevant all the time gotcha i think i think the important thing for me is to build on the experiences that i've had right mm. um to take what i've learned and what i've seen and to somehow make it relevant to today's world um we would often say you've got to stay one step ahead of the ball that's impossible now impossible if you can keep up with the ball, you're lucky at this yeah. point. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I read something that university students that are studying computer science, when they graduate, when they come out, everything that they've learned is obsolete. Mm. It's insane. It so stay, stay with, with the ball, you know. Um, well, keep the other thing, <laughs> yeah, keep chasing it. The other thing that I learned too is that, um, you know, what I did when in my twenties or, or thirties, I don't particularly do now, but I'm not working any less. I may only be behind the chair two days a week, but I'm doing other things that are probably more relevant to, to me and my age and my experiences and stuff that I can share. So you don't always have to be doing the same thing as long as you're doing and as long as you're moving. I look around a lot. Um, I hated social media at, at the beginning, but now you have to know mm. social media. You have to know it. Mm. And um, you know where I get my lessons from? My kids. Yeah, I was going to say your kids. Yeah. 
My 16 year old, whip, 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 whip. You know, I'm like, wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> My young one changes the ringtone. So, you know, I always carry my phone with me, and I know that sometimes that's a no-no. But occasionally, I'll get you know, you know, ducks or a, you know, or a train in my pants or something. You know, so that's always fun. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, so, yeah. all right. Well, listen before we before we wrap up, just one thing I want to ask you about is what would be the most important sort of nugget, the most important bit of wisdom mm. that you pass on that you've learned as a salon owner as a salon manager yeah. what would what yeah. would there be one thing that you'd pass on to someone else i think um understanding what you don't know is key and the way to fix it is to hire the people that can help you with it mm. right and this isn't a pitch for me. It's not a pitch for Anthony. But hire people that can help you. Even the president has an advisor. Mm. I'll say that again. Even the president has an advisor. Mm. So a coach, a trainer, a consultant, a book, um, something that is going to give you a different perspective, um, an empathy, if you like, on what it is that you're doing. Um, there's not one book, there's not one coach, there's not one consultant that will fix things for you. But a little bit of this and a little bit of that is good. You know, we talked about training, you know, a new curriculum. We, you know, Anthony's got these three books, which I love, and they're written in a way that anyone can understand them. Mm. You know? And there's four of them. <laughs> oh, there's four now. Well, I'm behind, I'm behind the ball. I thought you had all four of them, but anyway. I'm behind the eight ball again. Here we go. <laughs> so there you go, time management, as we said. So um, the bit of wisdom, I guess the nugget is, is to really, is to be humble enough to tell yourself, I don't know this, mm. or I need help with this. Mm. And um, the minute you do that, your life will change. You know, mm. I put myself uh, on my website. I say hiring a coach or a consultant or whatever is like going to the gym. You've been to the gym a thousand times. You know what to do, right? But the minute you hire a personal trainer, he or she is going to tell you, okay, why don't you hold the bar this way? Or why don't you put your, your hands there? And you will get the results that you want quicker with less damage, with, mm. without an injury, because you've got someone looking over your shoulder. Mm. And don't be afraid um, to do that. You know? you know, people say, oh, I can't afford it. I'm going to take your words. You can't afford not to do it, mm. especially now, especially because people are moving at such a fast pace. Um, reinvention, reevaluation, restructuring, is key. We were the Madonna or hair salons. Every every two years we'd paint the place or we'd get new furniture or I'd create a new system or, you know. Mm. Yeah, so and reinvention. You have to. You yeah. have to stay yeah. on it. I mean, I look at some of the places, you know, that we talked about before that have just done the same thing for mm. years and they've lost re relevance. Yeah. Exactly. Sad enough. Okay, well, listen, on that note, um, we better uh, wrap up here. We're sort of running out of time. But where can people connect with you on Instagram or other social media channels or on your website? I know you said that most of those stories are on your website as well. Um, so what, where can they um, connect with you and find out more about Thank you. you. Alex Hair Coach. Um, I changed it. It's way easier than trying to spell out my last name. Yeah. Alex Hair Coach. Dot com, or I'm on Instagram, um, Facebook, so... You know, and I'm available. I offer a, a complimentary 30 minute chit chat to see if there's a love connection. And I view myself as the baby steps, um, with all due respect, to Anthony. So well, I don't have what Anthony has. And, um, it, you know, I was complimenting him earlier because it's bloody genius and I'm jealous. But, uh, yeah, I offer the baby steps to that. So, well, don't um, underestimate what you do bring to it because you bring a uniqueness you, to it, to your approach, your experience, because that's the thing you were just talking about before with having a coach or something is 
it's it's like I've never thought of it in the context that you just said about even the president has an advisor, but even a uh, I often talk about it in the context of a tennis players that like mm. you know a tennis player has a coach. Now that doesn't mean that their coach is better at playing tennis than them because if they were, then they wouldn't be coaching. They'd be on the court because they'd be they winning a lot more exactly. money. If you know what I mean? <laughs> but but they bring a different insight to it. They bring a different yeah. perspective to it. And yeah. and any time you've got someone that can do that in any capacity, that can only make you stronger for you know having gone through that yeah. process so listen i'll put those links on uh the Thank grow my salon business.com website and in the show notes for today's podcast um if you're listening to this podcast with alex and you've enjoyed it then do me a favor take a screenshot on your phone share it to your instagram stories and don't forget to subscribe and leave us a rating and review on the apple podcast app so uh, to wrap up, Alex, um, thank you very much for being on thank this you. week's episode of the Grow My Salon Business podcast. Thank you very much, my friend. Cheers, I mate. hope to see you again soon in Chicago. Thank you. I'll look forward to it, but I'll be looking over my shoulder next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Good to see you. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you'd like to connect with us, you'll find us at growmysalonbusiness.com or on Facebook and Instagram at growmysalonbusiness. And if you enjoyed tuning into our podcast, make sure that you subscribe, like, and share it with your friends. Until next time, this is Anthony Whitaker wishing you continued success.